Maturity is the strength to make the right choice, even when the emotions or context of the moment would cause you to do something different. You just heard a small clip from Paul Cole as he shares with me about the crisis of fatherlessness and what Christian Men's Network is doing to mentor and disciple men around the world in this episode of The 318 Project. This is The 318 Project, a guide to equip men through godly principles and develop as husbands, fathers, and sons. And now, your host, Ryan Hare. Hello, and thank you for joining me on the 318 Project. I'm Ryan Hare, and today I have a distinguished guest. Uh, He is a friend and a brother, uh, someone that I met a few years back through a lot of the stuff that we have been doing. And this is kind of a culmination of what has helped create the 318 Project. Um, He is a, a speaker, an author. Of course, he's a husband, a father, and a grandfather. But he is also the co-founder and president of Christian Men's Network. Please welcome with me, Dr. Paul Lewis Cole. Hey, man, it's great to be with you, Ryan. Was was there an applause track or something right there? there, (laughs) You got one of those little buttons? Not yet, not yet. We'll we'll come to that soon, and and we'll we'll try to include some with that. (laughs) Yeah, I Um, love this, man. I love the whole three eighteen project, and and uh, three eighteen hit me again with that. Hit everybody about where'd that come from? It's based off of Genesis fourteen fourteen which, of course, is when Abraham was, uh, his his nephew Lot was taken captive. And the yeah. whole idea was that he trained up those 318 servants and men in his house to go rescue Lot. And so, again, that's the emphasis. And, of course, this goes back to uh, our dear friend and brother, uh, Jack King, and his ministry, uh, Faithful Men's Ministry. And that was yeah. the basis of their, of his ministry, of that 318. Yeah, so, this if, is, if it, so this is raising up the 318 Well, you know, the 318 Project is probably raising up multiples of that. Let's call it 318 times the thousand. What's that? 318,000. 318,000. That'd be awesome. So so the thing is, is that 318, when you talk about the 318 Project, you're talking about raising up mighty men, men who know how to fight, men who know how to stand uh, and fight for the next generation. Yes. You know, the thing is, Ryan, a warrior is not a man of war. A warrior is a man of peace who understands that peace is always the result of strength. Too often we think of, we, we misdefine things. We think, oh, warrior, warmonger. A warmonger is lustful, wants things for himself, willing to fight anybody to get it. A warrior loves others, and is willing to lay down his life for others. So, uh, you know, a man who's a true warrior lays down his life for his kids, his family. And laying down your life doesn't mean you're a lay down, right? Yeah. It means it's the strongest thing a man can do. Humility takes a lot more strength than being a glutton. Oh, definitely. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's being able to, um, like you said, you're, you're not so much sacrificing uh, being the sacrificial lamb, but you are sacrificing sometimes for the integrity of your family and your marriage and all that to to see that grow and benefit from it. Yeah, and what you've done with uh, 318, you give us a vision. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, that vision that vision goes back to again a lot of what this is about is what you know what your dad started uh, with the Christian Men's Network. And can you kind of talk a little bit about that emphasis of the three of the uh, Christian Men's Network for me? Yeah, you know, cmn.men is the website, and there's a lot of history there. My father, Dr. Ed Cole, um, 44 years ago, it would have been uh, 1977, uh, in in the summer of that year, he went and spoke at a camp for men. Uh, Marion Ravan was the pastor up in Oregon, and during that experience, it, it just rocked his world because God gave him a word for those men of repentance. And he came back, he was a pastor of a local church, not a large church there, you know, mid-sized church there in Costa Mesa, California. And he came back, and I remember him calling me. I was in business most of my life, and and I was at work. He calls, says, I got to talk to you. And we got together, he says, something happened. He said, I believe God's birthed in my heart of ministry to men. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? Is that pancakes? (laughs) What are we talking about? Right. You know, nothing gets pancakes, Ryan. No. And so, um, you especially know, with is, bacon. Yeah, come on, man. As long as there's bacon, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, um, 
So it's like, okay, what does that mean? He said, I, I believe it's to call men, you know, to be warriors, to call men to rise up. And I was like, man, that's different than what I see right now. And what he discovered is this. And I think it's still true in 94% of the churches in America, Ryan. And and really, you've got listeners all over the world. So, you know, this is basically true of every part of the world. Most pastors are trained how to preach sermons, not how to disciple men. So most yeah. men are taught how to listen to sermons, not how to study the Word of God. Right. Well, if all you're doing is listening, you're kind of passive, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and Joel 3, nine says, wake up the mighty men, get ready for battle. I don't, I don't think that word has ever gone away. I think that's the word for us today because we got a whole bunch of people that are woke, but not too many that are awake. Right. We're in a war. We didn't start it. We arrived in the middle of it. What's that? Wasn't that a Billy Joel song? <laughs> start the fire. Yeah. Come on, man. That was awesome. Billy Joel, he had it. He nailed it. We didn't start the fire. It was always burning, but we arrived in the middle of it. What are you going to do now? Right. What are you going to do? You're going to be a lay down. You're going to stand up as a warrior. You're going to be a 38 year old guy playing video games all night, <laughs> you know, and not going yeah. to your kids games. Right. Or, or are you going to bail on your wife after you've been married for seven years? Cause you're kind of like, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. Cause it's a little too hard. Right. Poor little baby. You know, the immaturity of men has led to the mediocrity of men. And uh, the toxicity of men has led to the redefinition of men when, in fact, manhood is one of the most important things on the face of the earth. Because it's, it's men that protect, if you will, protect the community. It's men that lay down their lives. It's men that stand uh, and hold their children's hands. It's, it's manhood. Every woman's looking for this. Let me give you something. In fact, anybody listening right now, just write it down. Write it down. Or, or Ryan will put it in the show notes. And it's something we teach at Christian Men's Network. And my dad, when he started this 44 years ago, and then five years after that, he writes this book that became kind of a progenitor of the modern day men's movement called Maximized Manhood. And he put it in there. He said, God wants every man to be consistent, decisive, and strong. So consistency, decisiveness, and strength are the hallmarks of a mature man, right? Yes. Well, that's what God wants in every man. And it's also what a woman wants in a man. <laughs> <laughs> Consistency, decisiveness, and strength. You know, make your decisions, speak your life, stand up. And we just got too many guys who are childish, man. Too many guys um, who are, um, you know, they're just, they're just uh, rolling out the little wuss thing and, you know, by the time the guy's, uh, let's say he's 35, he got married, he's got a couple kids, he's got a job, he hasn't read a book in 10 years, <laughs> uh, has a drink with the boys, uh, does a little bass fishing every couple weeks, goes hunting once a year, and then it's just, he's in a rut. He's just in a little thing, and, it, and his life's not going to come alive. Right. And he gets to his mid fifties and he goes, well, what the hell was this all about? Right. Oh, definitely. Yeah, that's I mean, a biblical that's... word, by the way, it's a biblical word. It's in the Bible. <laughs> right. So oh yeah. I only use biblical words. Yeah. So the fact is, is that now here's a guy in his mid fifties. He's got a crisis. And we talk about, you know, we kind of joke about it, midlife crisis, but the fact, why is there a crisis? Cause he doesn't have an identity. Yeah. He's been doing the same thing over and over. He's been doing the same thing. Just you know, doing the same thing. So now he's like, the kids are out of the house. He doesn't know how to talk to his wife. So now he spends more time fishing, more time with the guys having a drink. And then, of course, the next thing, Ryan, you know, where you live is uh, the guy buys a vet and a gold chain and uh, unbuttons <laughs> three buttons. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You see those guys around. Dude, I'm telling you, man, it doesn't have to be that. It's no a joke about that, but a midlife crisis is a very real thing. Oh, uh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, and I think I think even a lot of what happened this last year uh, with the uh, the crisis and everything, and uh, you know, even though it was globally, we saw how it brought families 
where they couldn't go out and do the things they normally do of, you know, that those fun activities outside, outside the house. Cause a lot of times, like you said, that the guy is off doing his thing, the, the wife is doing her thing. The kids have their, their sports and their ball games or whatever. And so now none of that was going on. So now you've got this family dynamic now that is pushed together. And like you said, if there's, if there's yeah. no conversation, no communication going on in the house, yeah. now it's bringing more stress and tensions and it, and it raises those stress levels. And like you said, for the, for those men, a lot of times it was, what do you, I revert back to, you know, the alcohol or, or whatever it is. And you just, it, it just, it, like you said, you put, just put more fuel to the fire. Um, causing more issues. It's what you guys teach with 318 Project is pressure doesn't make a man. Pressure only reveals a man for who he really is. Right. And so under pressure, we find out who a guy is. It reminds me of Psalm 78. And uh, the writer, it's uh, Asaph, I think is uh, the writer, not David, but uh, he's talking about how we forget the goodness of God and how we forget our identity. And it says that the men of Ephraim were trained warriors. They knew how to fight and said, but in the day of battle, they turned back. And it says, and then you say, why? Well, how, why? Why did that happen? And states it there, it says, because they forgot the strength of the God they followed. They forgot that they were called of God. They forgot they were the army of God. They forgot their identity. And so when the battle came, the stress came, the pressure came, they turned around. You know, the COVID shutdown did more than just shut down a disease. It shut down the hearts of men. Yeah. And and we see that in all areas of culture. And you've, you've seen it. You're very astute. You look at different things and dude, we, we, we entered the pandemic. Listen, check this out. Check this out. We entered this pandemic with 64% of the high school students in America having a clinical anxiety disorder. I think about that. Yeah. So the suicide rate goes up among teens and, and young, I mean, 10, 11, 12 year olds. Suicide rate spikes to the point that the Las Vegas school district decided to reopen the schools in a state that was closed. They said, well, we have to reopen the high schools because too many of our students are taking their lives. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, we see how that that's becoming, a, you know, not just the p- pandemic of the virus, but what other things it's triggered of, like you said, depression, anxiety um, and leading up to suicide, uh, drug addiction, alcoholism. Uh, uh, we're seeing uh, the rise in abuse. Uh, you know, I think in uh, several episodes back, I had a had an interview with um, our our good friend and uh, somebody that's on the board for for CMN, uh, Rob Carmen, and he talked about yeah. how in California, the hotlines, the 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 number of calls coming into the hotline were just astronomical uh, because of just because of the pandemic and just that having to deal with suicidal thoughts and and lot, people just being stressed. Uh, but we're seeing that again, we're, we're seeing that men are not stepping up as their roles. I mean, we see so much going on with society today that men are not really stepping up to the be, be the man that God has called him to be. I mean, we see society is trying to redefine yeah. every identity and, and, you know, especially manhood. So, so what is that? The, the the goal here for CMN as as you do as you and others are doing this we see this is not just you know for the states this is globally yeah. that you're you're trying to reach men because we know how a man acts in here in the states is different to to Europe and Africa and the, that because again what they are brought up to do as men so h- how is it that y'all are reaching uh, men around the world through this yeah. Yeah, we're in 134 countries and 36 languages, I think. We've just finished Maximize Manhood in Farsi. And then we're working on uh, the Thai translation right now. And then we'll be doing broadcasts direct like we did into Vietnam. We did a a direct broadcast. We trained uh, 2,400 pastors how to disciple men. Here's the deal. You touch the heart of a man, you've you've reached the soul of a nation. And if you can change... Here's the deal, Ryan. If you could change fatherhood, if you could dent, put a dent into fatherlessness, fatherlessness is the leading indicator of poverty in every culture of the world. 
fatherlessness is a leading indicator of uh, future incarcerations of young people, drug abuse, uh, unmarried uh, pregnancies, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So fatherlessness, massive issue. In fact, uh, there are many people in leadership in the United States and other countries who look at it as an underlying issue, one of the largest, if not the largest underlying issue in the culture. And here's right. one of the reasons I think we've been misguided. We got distracted. And I'll get back to the definitions thing. But I think we've been distracted, Ryan, and that we've become more concerned about the calorie content of our children's lunches than the character content of our children's hearts. And when you talk about manhood, why is the definition of manhood changed? Because Bible says that when people don't when people don't want rules or regulations, they cast off restraint. That's what it says. Right. In other words, they don't want to live inside the white lines. You know, the white lines in most countries have have lines on the road. Now, I've been in some that don't, and it's chaotic. The lines in the road aren't uh, to restrict you, but to keep you from killing people or keep people from killing you. Right. You might be the best driver on the road, but if somebody else doesn't know where to drive. So those lines are not about restricting you. They're actually about setting you in a place of uh, freedom to become everything you are. But people who, who want to be unrestricted or we talk, we talk a lot about personal liberties and those things. When you don't want to be, when you want your actions to not be judged, when you want to act any way you want, sexually and morally, uh, with greed, with avarice, what, whatever it may be, if you want to act that way, you don't want something judging you. You don't want a standard. So if you don't want to have to grow up and grow a pair and be a man, then you don't want to have the definition of manhood around. So you begin restricting it. And then the yeah. feminist movement, you know, it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing. I'll get to that. The feminist movement then begins to tear down manhood because they want certain rights and so forth. And not to say that men hadn't been pretty boorish in their behavior towards women. You know, that's something that has to be, you know, that's something that Christianity changed. It's amazing how many women started coming to Christian churches because when Christianity became, be, began, it honored women. Yeah. You know, the first person that saw the empty tomb celebrated recently at Easter, the first person that saw the empty tomb, tomb was a woman. Right. And in the, it says came in the, in the early, early morning. It was still dark. And, and she brought back, they brought back word. Well, they were trusted. What's that all mean? That means that Christianity honors women. Christianity elevates women. Christianity is gives women an identity as a joint heir, not as a secondary citizen. You know, we see the issues yeah. with a lot of the uh, uh, prejudicial actions towards Asian women. And the fact is, is that for centuries, Asian women have been put down by their own culture and other cultures. You go back and think about the restricting of the size of their feet. There's just a, a hundred different things that happen to those women. Christianity yeah. sets women free, and it sets men to be free into what they're supposed to be. Right. So, so back on this thing of uh, manhood, Ryan, manhood is just becoming who you are as a man. Manhood, manhood is um, saying, I accept responsibility. Definitely. I'm, I'm willing to grow up. You know, the Bible says, uh, Paul said it to a group of people in Corinth in this church that was there, and he's trying to help them. He wrote them a couple letters. We call it First and Second Corinthians because he wrote it to a church in Corinth. And in one of those letters, he says, hey, right near the end, he says, he says listen, here's what you need to do. You need to grow up. Uh, you need to be strong, be faithful, put away childish things, be a man says, when I grew up, I put away childish things. So that's the issue. Most guys don't want a, a strong definition of manhood because they'd like to just go ahead and screw around. Yeah. And, and that kind of goes back to, you know, one of those principles because, you know, again, a lot of what your dad wrote, uh, y'all kind of defined them as coalisms. 
And, and one of those main ones that always stuck out, and I think y'all emphasize a lot of it is, you know, about maturity. You know, maturity isn't about the age, um, but like you said, it's about accepting responsibility because you can have a, a teenager like like David was. It wasn't about his age, um, but it was the fact that he took responsibility um, for everything that he did from his father in the fields to, you know, with Saul and all that. But then you look at, at Saul and even other men in, in today's society that can, like you said, 50, 60, 70 years old, and they're still acting like a kid, you know, that playboy mentality and not and not being the mature man that they're supposed to be. You know what, Brian, you, you nailed it right there, man. You know, being a, a mature man, maturity isn't um, about age. It's about the acceptance of responsibility. So let's define maturity because definitions are important. You know, whoever defines the language, controls the conversation. Whoever controls the conversation creates the culture. So definitions are key. That's why we so miss some stuff that God wants for us because we define it based on our human experience rather than what God meant it to mean. I'll give you a word. And I'll get back to that. In fact, remind me where I was. So, okay. but, but I'll give you a word that we misdefine all the time. That's the word peace. Peace in, in uh, our culture today here on the earth is uh, the absence of conflict, the absence of storms, uh, the absence of, uh, you know, issues, problems. And so, for instance, like peace in the Middle East, we want peace in the Middle East. Well, what does that mean to us? It means no conflict, no war, no problems, no storms. But peace in the word of God and lived out in the life of Christ never meant the absence of conflict. It always meant the presence of God, even in the middle of the conflict. Yeah. The presence of Christ, even in the middle of the storm. So this, so when we come back and we talk about definitions and definitions of maturity, maturity, let me define it. Maturity is the, maturity is the strength to make the right choice, even when the, emotions or context of the moment would cause you to do something different. In other words, you, 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 most of the time guys make wrong decisions and you and I have lived this and we've talked to enough men to know that you could say to a guy, Hey, you knew that was wrong, right? Well, yeah, I knew that was wrong. You knew that could oh, yeah. get you in trouble, right? Yeah. It's good. <laughs> most of the time, man, we know. All right. Here's the right thing to do. Here's the wrong thing to do. But the wrong thing really feels good. Yeah. You know, the wrong thing could be awesome. Now, could get in trouble, but it's that old uh, Michigan phrase, you know, hold my beer. Watch this. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, God, hold on a second. Let me try this. And, uh, dude, we we usually know. Right. You know that something's wrong before you even go there. And and so maturity is making the right decision in the face of, I'd really like to make the wrong decision. Yeah. You know, I'd really, I'd really like to do the Samson Delilah thing. I, you know, <laughs> but, you know, basically, you know, Samson ended up, I mean, the last thing of his life obviously was a redemptive moment. Right. God yes. gave him strength back for a, a particular grace in that moment, but he didn't finish his life strong. Right. You know, he may be in Hebrew, Hebrews 11, but he didn't bring uh, joy to his family or his people. He didn't finish his life strong. And yeah. I think for you and I, Ryan, what we'd like to do, kids, grandkids, all that stuff, legacy. Yeah. I think most of us as men would like to like to finish strong. Yeah. Oh yeah. We, we all want that. Yeah. I, I mean, so. I think there's that that part if you know if and you probably remember the movie Sandlot you know where where the the ghost of of Babe Ruth comes to to the uh the the one kid he says you know um you know legends live you know you know there's that part of legends and heroes are for a moment but legends live forever you know so again it's what what are we bringing what are we leaving for for our family you know is it just that moment of popularity you know we see that in sports and athletics and you know celeb being a celebrity in, in hollywood or whatever you know is it that long term of uh, goals and achievements or is it what they've left 
as a living legacy onto that next generation. And that's yeah. what we're, that's what we're looking for. And that's what I think a lot of CMN is, is about is, as you've talked about, is that leaving a legacy, not just for the next generation of our kids, but you know, the, the following generations of grandkids and great grandkids and those, those generations that will probably after we're past that, you know, are still being, um, in, you know, blessed through, through all that we've done. I mean, that yeah. goes back to what's your dad, you know, because I, I, I remember reading, you know, and it's in one of your dad's books. And I think you even mentioned it of there's the, the one lady and it ends up, it was his aunt. Yeah. She, she went to a prayer yeah. meeting, got saved, wrote these letters to her sister, which was your sister. grandmother. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we, we always look at the Billy Grahams and the, the big names, but here's this simple woman that because of her change in life, look what, look what her, her crown is going to be like because of what she has passed on through generation to generation. Yeah. Dude, you know, that, and, that lady, her name was Ethel Dean. <laughs> she was my great aunt and uh good Texas names. It was four sisters, the Goodrum girls of Cherokee County, Texas. And that's where my heritage goes back to on that side. And then on my mom's side goes back to, uh, goes back to Ireland and Scotland, Nova Scotia and so forth. Right. But wow. the, um, the thing is that Ethel, she's a little lady, she's still about five foot tall. And a uh, little white haired lady. And she was always a lady that showed up with, uh, you know, potluck. You know, <laughs> she was the same church, lived in the same house 60 years. She lived to be 96. Her husband left her when she was 26. Had wow. one son. He was dis- disjointed. And she was just a faithful woman who's, who showed up. But when she was in her early 20s, she wrote letters to her three sisters from California back to Cherokee County saying, hey, I've... Uh, Started going to this church, pastor by a woman called Amy Simple McPherson. First, the start of what's called the Four Square Church Movement. And she said, my life's radically changed. So those letters, all three of those sisters ended up becoming followers of Christ. And and all those kids out of those sisters became uh, different types of ministers and business leaders and pastors. and Pretty amazing thing. But my dad came out of that. And so right. my, my grandmother, Florence, went out there. You know, uh, she ended up planting three churches. My dad had this ministry. He's launched. And see, his, you know, what you do in life as a man becomes history. But what you put into motion becomes your legacy. Yeah. And that little lady, Ethel Dean, nondescript, like people would think, what did this woman ever do with her life, Ryan? And she died at 96. She was she was buried. Uh, there, I think there were 14 people around the grave at a memorial service there in central Los Angeles. And people would think, well, nice woman, nice lady. But those letters that she wrote to her sisters held in them the future for millions of men around the world for for not only up till today, but for decades beyond now for a hundred years from now. Right. So dude, that's why, that's why we stay strong, stay, stay pure, stay true. Cause it's about others. It's about, you know, why do I, why do I hold on to stuff, Ryan? Why right. do you do the right thing? The right thing. Well, we do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, but, yeah. but we also, and we're warriors, but we also do that because it affects other people. Oh Yeah. And go, kind of going back a little bit, because you, you were talking about maturity and you were kind of given that definition. Um, I've been reading now you you have written a couple books uh, as, on your own. Um, one of them is called Bartender, which is no, on the, just, just the bartender, just the bartender, which yeah, is on. Yeah, we call it uh, bartender, but it's just the bartender, <laughs> which is based on the life of Nehemiah. Yes. And then yeah, the he, other one is is daring. And it's yeah, a, and daring. your second one's daring call, and it's a, a call to a courageous manhood, and that's one yeah. I've been kind of reading here here the last the last couple of weeks. And when you said that, it brought back a, a point on that that you know you said the standing up uh, in that time, and there was a part where you talk about the three teenagers with courses courses Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego yeah. when they Man's when yeah. when they were you know to, when everybody was told to bow down to the um, 
the statue of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and they were the three that wouldn't. You know, even though society's norm was to do this, just because it was the right thing to do according to society, you know, ethically or morally or you know spiritually, it's not the right thing to do. And you're still taking that stand is right. that part of maturity. Yeah, yep. And as you write in it, you say, daring men stand, but they don't stand still. And that's just powerful. Well, you know, having done all stand, Ephesians 6, doesn't mean having done all hang out. Uh, it's just like uh, one of my favorite Psalms that comes back to me anytime there's crisis is Psalm 46. And it says he's God, even in the middle of uh, raging oceans and waves and crap going on and and he says, and that's the pl- place where he says, be still and know that I am God. And if we're not careful in misdefining things, we think be still is like, just go get in a room and wait for God to do something. No, mm-hmm. be still is to to do what you know is the right thing to do right now. Yeah. Because that's all you can do at this moment. You know, I have a dear friend that that uh, went in the hospital yesterday and, and uh, had a heart issue and you know, all he knew what to do was just be still, know that I'm God. What does that mean? It doesn't mean he waited outside and goes, God, you know, if you want to be in that hospital, you know, you'll move the hospital over to me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, we get goofy with this stuff, man. No, walk in the hospital, take care of business. Right. Be still, know that I'm God. That means get up at, you know, six and, and get in the word for a half hour and then be with your family for a half hour and go to work, whatever your thing is, yeah. your, your rhythm, you know, make, be still know that I'm God, do the stuff that a man does. Definitely. And and that's the thing is, you know, and that's what we're trying to do through, through the, you know, through the podcasting. And then of course, through the different ministries is, you know, reaching those men and just showing them that this doesn't, ha- you know, what we've seen in the church and with men on a general should not be the norm. The norm should be what Christ has called us to be. You know, like you said, a lot of that was he had a plan. He put it in 12 men. You know, that was, you know, and as, as a uh, Jack always used to say, there was no plan B plan. A was 12 men. Um, and it went from there, you know, so he had no plan B. So that plan no, is still, still, that plan is still in, in yeah, effect with we're still us. In plan A and that's the book so, of Acts. <laughs> yeah. The book of Acts had no closing salutation because it's not done. Yeah. So again, a lot of a lot of what y'all do is with the Global Fatherhood Initiative, and again, mm-hmm. it's it's a it's a international to to help with that that fatherless uh, issues. But also here in the last uh, year, and like you said, you kind of started it. I remember last year y'all did a, a two day thing, and now you're going into what y'all call the dangerous nations, and y'all are trying to reach yeah. those nations that the gospel is very hard to get into, much less you know breaking it into. Uh, helping men see their role in Christ. Um, so I know you've done with Vietnam. Y'all have got some others coming up here in the, in the future, right? With that yeah, some Nigeria, dangerous nations. yeah. Places that are uh, either dangerous to be a Christian or, or just dangerous, you know, uh, dangerous to be a woman uh, like Bulgaria, Bulgaria, one of the highest uh, places of trafficking women in the world goes through, from Bulgaria or through Bulgaria. And it's also a place where children are sold and killed to be parts that get sold. It's it's wow. so brutal and terrible. You just, it's hard to believe that people do this. But, um, but yeah, so Bulgaria, then Iran, which is Farsi, Bulgaria, the Bulgarian language, and then uh, Nigeria, which is a, a English and some forms of English and, and some tribal stuff. But, you know, there's more Christians being killed every day for their faith in Nigeria than any other nation of the world. Wow. In fact, it rivals the rest of the world combined. The Fus- the Fulani uh, tribesmen in the north, uh, Boko Haram, which, you know, we hear about because they abduct 300 girls at a time. Right. Uh, that's basically the way they run their business because it's uh, they do that for money. Um. Because ransoms are paid, even though they say they're not. Yeah. And you've got Boko Haram, Al Qaeda, uh, the whole North. You've got incursion of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and so forth. So it. So we're going in there helping pastors train. Hey, how are we going to reach young men? Right. 
you, you reach them by raising up great fathers. Yeah. So if we can reach men who will reach the next generation, we can change everything. Because uh, Al Qaeda, when they recruit, I don't know if you've ever seen one of their recruiting videos. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're pretty amazing, right? They're like, uh, like it shows them out training in the desert, and they say, "Why well, you soft people are lying in your beds? We are training in the desert. Yeah, while well, you are eating your face and to full, we are we are fasting for our faith in the desert." You know, man. I mean, it's like calls young men who are disaffected, who have been, uh, who are fatherless. And that's their number one recruiting ground in the whole world is those young men. So how do we change terrorism? I think you, I think you not only have to fight it on the government side, education side, whatever, but I think we have to reach to the hearts of young men. Say God has a purpose in your life. And I think part of doing that is reaching dads, global fatherhood initiative, and then dangerous nations is just an outworking of that to go to the 50 most dangerous nations of the world, right. raise up 50,000 pastors who disciple 5 million men over the next five years. That, that's great. Cause I know um, one of them, of course, has been a part of CMN for a long time is uh, pastor Eddie Leo in, in Indonesia. And, and he's what he's reached over a million men that yeah. have been, that have gone through the, the curriculum and the books and all that. Yeah, my actual the, count. So, so again, you know, for that large of a country, you've got a million men that have been discipled. Um, again, what is that force and that power that, that God can use those men uh, around the world? I mean, think about that. This is, this is an amazing story. Uh, Eddie Leo uh, has a Chinese Indonesian background, which makes him less than 10% of the population. And in a, in a population that was somewhat uh, being prejudiced against and, and so when he was a young man, he went away to school. And with a couple other friends, they became followers of Christ. He wasn't going to go back to Indonesia. And yet the call of God on his life said, go back to Jakarta. He goes back with his friends in Jakarta. Three of them start a Bible study. And that Bible study now has grown over the last 30 years to be a church of uh, 200,000 people. It's over 200,000 now. They're in Jakarta. When he saw the the uh, discipling of men, he said, that's the next thing we have to do. We've got to disciple men. Yeah. So they launched an initiative, he and 150 other church leaders across Indonesia. So I went there a year ago, February, Ryan. Now, this is like after the Wuhan virus comes out in January, and I'm in Hong Kong in February. Right. Not knowing how bad this is. And I'm met by people in hazmat suits, taking my temperature, <laughs> checking my stuff, man. I'm like, you know what? This might be serious. And uh, there's nobody in the Hong Kong airports, usually packed. And then went on. Uh, so we did in Indonesia. We graduated our one millionth man and then went into Vietnam and set up the stage for the broadcast that we've done since then, training of the pastors. But, dude, that was like. And that, you know, it was still like, I don't think we got it quite yet in the U.S. that this was kind of a dangerous thing. And so right. everywhere I went in Asia, there's hazmat suits, meeting us at the airport. They're cleaning stuff on the planes or handing out stuff to clean things with. I get back to the U.S., to Dallas. I come walking through customs and, uh, you know, immigration and all that. And the police, you know, the guy at TSA just goes, hey, how you doing? Good. Great. Thanks. See ya. No mask, no nothing. Hey, welcome to back to the U.S. Yeah. And I think we found out. But the deal is, is those guys did that. You know why? Because they saw the need for it. And right. so Eddie Leo, here's another story right there. Eddie Leo and a few guys persecuted, not of the high level, the high caste, whatever you want to call it there in Indonesia, just started a Bible study. And they started something where they called it one another lifestyle. Like, like you and I, Ryan, would grab one of your books, you know, uh, and, and would get together, just you and me for coffee once a week, be part of the church, start growing together. And they, they created that kind of discipleship, very organic. And the thing just blew up. Now, check this out. That nation of Indonesia 15 years ago was 95% Muslim. 4% Christian, 1% other. Today, Indonesia is over 30% followers of Jesus Christ. 
That's awesome. And again, it just starts out with something basic. You know, we can't, we get this idea that you got to be just, it's got to be a big, big events, big yeah, things. Yeah. But if it's, it, it may take a while, but if it starts with small, like you said, those one-on-one connections, but as they grow, they multiply because you're doubling. If that, now that man is discipled one. Now they, then they go disciple another one. And you never know where it, that's going. Bro. And it, it just multiplies. And like you said, you don't know um, that again, you can, like you said, you change a heart, you change a nation. Um, and again, we see that we've, we've seen that we've seen the numbers like y'all talk about so much of like, they're going from a, a small percentage to, it's not the majority, but it's, you know, compared to what it has been, it's increased, you know, fivefold, tenfold, whatever. Um, you know, you go into Uganda, the, the, the issue, the things that have taken place in Uganda and you see because of Alex Matala and a lot of them talking about the, that being a man and the integrity of your virginity that and because of the issues with the AIDS epidemic and crisis, how the, that mortality rate has dropped from what was it? 30% years ago to yeah. down to 6% yeah. now uh, yeah, of, of people dying from AIDS. 3% of the culture was dying of AIDS, had AIDS. And the death rate was so large that they had 8 million orphans. This is not a massive nation, Uganda. And so this is uh, 28 years ago, Ryan, and Alex Matala and a number of uh, key friends. Now, these were not highly placed guys. These weren't guys well-known. They were just men who had a burning passion to reach our culture for Christ and to save it, rescue it. So they began to teach maximize manhood and the glory of virginity to young men and women. And they just started networking it. Like, you know, I would tell you and you tell another guy and he tells another guy. And this thing began to grow and uh, churches began to adopt it. And they ended up in 14,000 churches. And then the schools opened up because the president said, hey, the nation's dying of AIDS, man. And we need your help. They ended up sending people into 16,000 schools. And and, uh, the remarkable thing that happened is over that 20, over about a 20 year period up until the last stats I have are from about three or four years ago. The rate of AIDS was 6.4%, yeah. and it dropped from 33%. Well, that, yeah. all be- that, that happened because of faith-based organizations. Now, the World right. Bank would tell you it happened because of condoms. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But every place that they've <laughs> – This is properly funny. educated and, and – Dude, that. I'm telling you, man, they had signs everywhere, Ryan, that said uh, ABC, abstinence, be faithful – and Christ. Yeah. Wow. The World Bank came in about 10, 12 years ago and changed it from, to abstinence, be faithful, and condoms. Mm. When they did that, the rate of AIDS started going up again. <laughs> wow. So it was like, okay, wait a minute. Maybe that doesn't work. Maybe the no. wisdom of this world is all, is really is foolishness. Oh, yeah. Isn't that Romans 1? Thinking themselves to be wise, they became right. fools. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and we see so much of that. Uh, but again, so a lot of this, we've kind of talked about a lot of this. And so again, with CMN and, and your dad, basically, like you said, he started with one book, made, uh, Maximize Manhood, which when I read that and going through all this stuff was like, I never got to meet him. He had passed away before yeah. I got in, involved in all this, the, the curriculum and material. But I know it was more of the Holy Spirit. And that's why I tell a lot of people when I say, when you read the book and it feels like it's talking to you. You're like, how does Dr. Cole know what I was doing in my life? Because it was like just just piercing, piercing me like, you know, that checking. Yeah. But it was the checking of the Holy Spirit. And that's what's so um, been so instrumental with, I believe, with this ministry and the curriculum in those books, because, you know, you get other men and there's nothing wrong with a lot of those. There's so much material men's materials out there um, and a lot of them are good. But there's just something about this when it speaks to your heart like it does, you you know, there's something powerful about it. Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. That's the thing. Men are the same all over the world. You know, there's three things that, you know, particularly in today's culture, it was different 30 years ago. Men 30 years ago wanted success, respect and legacy. And I think today it's it's more identity, purpose and brotherhood or belonging. And I think it's, you know, because things shift from generation to generation. I'd I'd say most young people are thinking uh, not in terms of success, but more in terms of identity. 
and not in terms so much of respect, but in purpose. So what's my identity, purpose, and belonging? Uh, you know, to belong to something larger than myself. Well, my goodness, man, Jesus Christ deals with all three of those things. Right. Identity, my identity is found in Christ. Uh, my purpose, my mission, to be here on the earth, to, to be his light on the earth, to proclaim his goodness, to be everything he designed me to be. You know, there's another definition thing, success. What's true success? To fully satisfy your personal design. So I think of Alex Matala. This is a guy who had a great drive for success. Uh, and he was extremely successful as a drug dealer. <laughs> Under, and that was when Idi Amin ran Uganda this is years ago. Yeah. And he was in, in, uh, and Alex became so powerful with his gang of people and his drug deal. And Idi Amin tried to have him killed. Ran for his life. He's down in Kenya. He's wanting to come back to Uganda. Uh, and as he's coming back, he catches malaria. Goes gets gets this uh, like he's like seriously ill to where he's delirious. In the middle of his delirium, he has a dream, and in the dream, a voice tells him, "Find Jesus, <laughs> and you'll solve everything." Wow. He doesn't know who that is. He's like, "Dude, I don't know who this is. is this Jesus, Jesus, who is this?" So uh, he's walking back into Uganda, trying to gather things back together. Idi Amin has just been deposed. So he's walking back into Uganda, and he hears some people singing. He's walking by a church, and they're singing about Jesus. And he goes, that's the guy. Mm -hmm. They're singing songs about this guy. Who is this guy? Goes in, meets Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Just a guy. He's just a guy who's a drug dealer. So he goes back. You know, it's to your point, Ryan, about it's not about doing the big thing. It's just doing the next thing. Yeah. God, God's not concerned about, you know, the titles that men give you. He's more concerned about whether or not you're doing his will. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, we get all caught up in titles and positions and influence and all, blah, 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 and this stuff. You know, let God take care of that stuff. So, so, um, so anyway, he goes in there, he gets becomes a follower of Christ. And then if you're a drug dealer, I guess when you get saved, Alex did this, you open up a drug rehab home. <laughs> so, uh, that's what he did. And he just started speaking to men about Jesus. And one thing led to another. He found the books, materials, maximized manhood, and what was called the glory of virginity, now called the sacredness of sex. Yeah. And he found those books and he said, okay, this will change things. And he got six guys. I met these guys, Ryan. I was there. Uh, these were not, like I said, these were not well-known, well-funded, well-anything guys. They were just guys passionate about Christ, passionate about others, and willing to lay down their lives. And that's what they did. And changed Uganda. I'm telling you, man, there's there's uh, amazing things we can accomplish if we don't really give a rip about who gets uh, the medals for it, who, what our Instagram looks like. Right. Yeah, so many times we want that that recognition of, you know, well, I did this, I got this accomplished, you know, look at me. Uh, and, and in a sense, it's it's good because, again, part of, uh, you know, our ego is, you know, we want to be recognized, you know, just acknowledge that we've done stuff. But again, if it's if it's that's all we're, we're looking for, then we're missing the whole purpose and the point of, you know, we're doing a work for Christ and for God. And he's supposed to, he's the one that gets all the glory through all of this. And to see again, what, what all see him in and through the different lives that it's touched and built other ministries yeah. from that, that have, have branched off in a sense doing, you know, guys doing their ministry, they may not get that recognition. But again, if we're seeing, you know, brothers coming into doing this, stuff, this man. brotherhood, you know, this, as we, as y'all call it, the, um, Brother, commissioned brotherhood, yeah, uh, you know that all about doing the stuff. Just, just brotherhood, you know, commissioned men, yeah, and it's it's having that that same core uh, foundation that you know if if each each brother, whether whatever country they're from, it's that same foundation which is founded on Christ and those biblical principles. Come on, man, you know uh, we launched the day you and I are talking as we're recording this. Uh, we launched a podcast. Uh, with our brave men podcast with Christian Men's network that uh, with Daryl strawberry, who, you know, most people, it's funny how many people I'll mention that name and they go, Oh yeah, I've heard of that guy. Or, or I know who he was. And he was a brilliant baseball player. He's, he was in four world series, eight times an all-star 
Yeah. Um, nominated for Hall of Fame. Probably won't ever get it because of his drug abuse and stuff. But there's a guy who had fame. He had fortune. He had money. He had everything. Yep. And and still felt empty. And I talked to him and I said, you know, what was what was your feeling? He said, I still felt like I wasn't affirmed as a man. Right. I mean, think about this, dude. This guy could hit home runs. This guy could major league baseball was so easy for him. He'd smoke joints between innings. You know, it was it's unbelievable. And and so Daryl, we talked about the redemption of a legend. Right. When he found Christ, he found his center. When he found Jesus Christ, he found his purpose. He found his identity. Uh, he became a man who had a future and a legacy. It's a great story. You know, he uh, he did basically get out of baseball too soon because he didn't take care of himself and he did drugs and alcohol and a bunch of stuff. Right. And so he, he comes to Christ, gets saved. He's doing great for a couple of years and then and marries his wife and, and everything's going great. And then he just flips out again and just, you know, took a left turn instead of a right. The right turn was the mature one. The left turn was the was the back to the addiction one. Makes a left turn. He ends up in this crack house down in Florida. And his wife shows up. It's a great story. His wife shows up at this place, knowing where he's at, knocks on the door, says, send my husband out, man. She just, <laughs> this guy comes out and says, nah, he's in the back. She goes, send him out. I'm not getting him. You send him out. So he comes to the door and says, listen, he said, you just go on with your life. You can have any money that was coming to me. Just go on. You know, he basically lost it all. But you go on with your life. And uh, I'll just go back in here and die. And she says, she grabs him by the collar. She says, you should be so lucky. <laughs> this is your best story. And I'm thinking, man, that's what brotherhood is. That's what friends are. Yeah. That's a wife, the love of a wife that won't give up on her husband. And I think there's a bunch of husbands that, that need to not give up on their wives, too. Oh, okay? yeah. I, think it's, I think it goes both ways, man. Definitely. In today's culture, where 24% of the users of pornography on online on the internet are women. Yeah, the numbers growing. You know? And so, uh, you know, so we live in an era and a culture in which there's a lot of stuff. But you know what? Jesus is Lord. He's the strength of our lives. We can be everything we were designed to be. We can raise up children that love us, that and we can love our wives, and we can do the right thing and have the power of the Holy Spirit help us do it. Yes, amen. And, and again, that's that the whole premise of the 318 that, you know, as I said with Jack was, you know, having those brothers, whatever the number was, that you had the you had your pastors back. But at the same time, if you had a brother that was caught up in something, they were willing to go in after them and, and, and rescue them from that situation, that crisis. And I remember him talking of stories. I've heard stories of guys going into bars and. And the brothers would go and stand across the street from the bar and the, you know, so now there's no, or they would stand at the door. And so nobody could go into the bar and the owner would come out and be like, what's going on? They're like, you've got such and such in there and we're going to stay here until you send him out. And the couple minutes later, here come the owner chucking the guy out the bar, you know, cause it yeah. was interfering with his business. Yeah. Um, but again, that's having brothers that are willing to go to an extent to, to rescue and save somebody, whether it's a physical death, uh, a mental death, or in most cases this of this, a spiritual death even. Um, and that's the power of a lot of this. And, and I want to thank, uh, thank you, Paul, and a lot of what this ministry means and does. You know, here's the deal, man. Um, you know, the whole thing is about discipleship. That's what Jesus did. You talked about it earlier, about 12 men, plan A. He discipled those men in three years, just three years with them, and then, and then gave them the infilling and power of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that's the work that every church needs to be doing in, on the face of the earth, to disciple men. I, I think the, oh, yeah. Here's the deal. I think the true measure of a church is not how many people are in your seats, but how many disciples are in your streets? Right. Oh, yeah. I think that's where we have to be, Ryan. And, and so I'm grateful for the 318 Project, for our partnership with Christian Men's Network, and uh, the things that we're doing together and other men like us. I mean, I'm pro all those guys, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, like uh, 
you know, whoever it may be, man, crank it up, keep it going. I'm rooting for you. And I, I, I get fired up when I see, you know, emerged men out in San Diego with their men's conference or, uh, Calvary Chapel, uh, where was that? Southern California. It was the Calvary Chapel that just had a, a men's meeting, and and it tripled the, the attendance that they expected to have. So wow, you know, it's just like let's do this thing. Let's raise up some mighty men for the next generation. Yes, and, and so so we've talked about a little bit of the as we're concluding here. We talked about the the curriculum. Uh, if if men are interested in looking into those books, uh, and the and it's a book and workbook that, like you said, it's either a one on one or a small groups. It's men's ministry, however they want to work on it. You know, some guys for me, it was kind of a of a group setting, but a lot of it I did on my own. Right. Where can they go to to get that that uh, yeah. those books and material? Yeah, cmn dot men Christian Men's Network cmn dot men. Okay. And then also majoringinmen.com, all yes. one word, majoringinmen.com. There's a training site that's free. Uh, it's been paid for by our partners and uh, friends. And that site is there, a 12-part series, to train you as a pastor or a church leader to uh, launch a powerful ministry to men, discipleship ministry. So there's that. And so, uh, man, I, I'm telling you, brother, uh, my passion – I know you feel the same way, Ryan, is is every time I think about what we do, I think of a dad holding his little girl. I think of I met a guy in Mongolia who was walking down a hallway. I took his picture. He turned around, took his picture. Mm-hmm. That little three-year-old daughter in his arms, and in his left hand, he had a Maximized Manhood book. It's awesome. in Mongolia. And I thought, man, that's it right now. That little girl hit the lottery now. Because yeah. her dad's going to love her, cherish her, affirm her. Um, protect her, give her a good name, right? And uh, I want that. I'm, I want that for every little boy and every little girl. Right. I believe that every child deserves a loving dad. Yes, and a strong, strong home, strong home foundation. And, and also, so with with that, you then you have, and you talked about it. You mentioned it there for a second. You have a podcast as well. It's called Brave Men. Um, yeah, love it. Great. I enjoy listening to it. You know, again, he- hearing some Thanks. of those guys that you've, you've had, um, I did get to start. I started listening to the Daryl strawberry one this morning. So I was excited about that one. He wasn't a big fan of my, I wasn't a big fan of his, but again, you know, during the eighties and all that, I'm a, I'm a diehard baseball fan. And so he was one of those, he's well, still rooted for, he's well, still rooted that. for him, you know, just to it's see pretty- the, he had a pretty amazing career, even yeah. though, you know, he screwed it up. He played the Mets, the Yankees, the Giants, and the Dodgers. Yeah. I mean, he played rival teams. He uh, he played pinstripes. He was with the Mets uh, when Gary Carter was there, and they won the oh, yeah. series. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. And, you know, he mentions in the podcast that he had some coaches, managers. He said, all my managers, he said um, – really had a uh, a heart for me as a man. He said it's probably one of the things that did keep me in baseball longer than probably he would have because he, he, I mean, he started messing up pretty early, and it goes back to fatherlessness. So, yeah, I've got that. And, and Monday Night Men is on uh, YouTube. Right. Yeah, yeah, so just you- type in Monday Night Men, three words, Monday Night Men, yep. and there's a bunch of teaching there, Christian Men's Network, uh, YouTube. Yep, and and a lot of that y'all base it. You you're, you've gone through a couple books. You've done, I think, two yeah. or three. You're on you're on a yeah. power of uh, potential right now. Power of potential, and then uh, we'll start in the fall of uh, 2021. Uh, we'll start through the book Real Man. Yeah, and, and a lot of that is again, what of the emphasis is is you do a, about a 30 minutes or so a discussion on one of the chapters, and then basically a lot of times guys that are streaming that are like you said um leaders and pastors or, or men's leaders in men's groups and then they break off into their little sessions afterwards yeah. going going through the book. So that's again just something added with that curriculum yeah, and that material. We got some churches that are meeting, their men's group is meeting and using the half hour video as their session teaching. Yeah. And then they break up into groups or whatever. And what that means is that the pastor or the men's leader doesn't come have to come mm-hmm. up with a sermon or whatever. It's all right. done. They just order the books hit the video you yeah. know, and uh, boom, there it is. 
And so we do that. It's a 29, 30 minute teaching. It is a full on strong, uh, cranked up teaching. And then you can, after that, whether individually at home right, or in a group, I've got one friend uh, down in Phoenix that, uh, you know, they meet, uh, he and his son and son-in-law, they meet and uh, watch the video earlier. They're in construction. They meet uh, Jason DeBus and they meet and uh, discuss it. And then his sons both go to work and he heads off to his business. And, <laughs> you know, so we find it all different ways that people are using it. It's pretty yeah, powerful. That's great. Yeah. And again, I will put all those links in the show notes so that if anybody's looking for them, they can you know click on them. And again, your Brave Men podcast, it's available on all the all the platforms out there, pretty much, right? Spotify, yeah, Apple, new Amazon one, Apple, yeah. Spotify. You know, it's every place the finer podcasts are. Like <laughs> so I'm just know, aspiring I mean, to be. Yeah, the thing is, is that <clears throat> you know. We just got to be light in the darkness, man. We don't know how long we're going to be able to be on some of these platforms when we start right. preaching the gospel. You know, the one thing that can never be canceled is the power of the cross. Amen. Especially with with what we are when we're recording this is is on Good Friday, and so the emphasis of the of the cross and everything that it means, um, you know, just with this weekend itself is just yeah. powerful. So as we close, uh, Paul, if you would, I would love for you to close us out in a word of prayer. That'd be great. And I want to invite anybody that's listening right now, if you've not fully committed your life to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you can do that right now. It's a a simple act of obedience that solves the complex issues of life. You know, Ryan and I have talked about the promises that God gave us and the promises of life, the promises of him, him being there. Psalm 23. A lot of people know it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The promises, and every promise in the Bible, hundreds of them, belong to those who are followers of Christ. If you've never done that, none of those promises are activated in your life. So right now, you can pray with Ryan and I and say, I want to do this, man. I'm tipping into this thing. And then for every single man who's listening right now, I want to thank you for being a man who has uh, been a part of the 318 podcast, the 318 Project. And and stay with it and make sure you click on there and subscribe to it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my friends right now. I thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ. I thank you for the resurrection, the empty tomb. I thank you that we can live life in the identity of Christ and we no longer have to just try to live it, gut it out on our own. But Father, you are there for us. I thank you that Jesus even told us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. So, Father, we pray that now in every single man right now who needs to pray this prayer. Father, let's pray this together, brothers. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of unrighteousness. Make me a new man. God, right now, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I commit myself to follow him, to read my Bible, to pray, to be a good person, to go after the things of God with as much strength as I can in the name of Jesus. Father, I bless my brothers who have prayed this. I thank you for our friends who are partners of the 318 Project. I thank you and bless them in everything they do. And Father, I pray for Ryan, that he's blessed and is going out and is coming in. That everything he does will prosper. Every place he puts his feet will be holy ground. And that God will keep Ryan and his family and loved ones deep within the grip of his favor and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Again, Paul, I appreciate it. Uh, Thank you for joining me. And it's always been a pleasure. And I hope you have a blessed and wonderful day. And you have this saying that you pretty much always end. I would love for you to end this episode with that saying about Jesus and hope. What is that? Yeah, yeah. Hope is alive. Hope has a name. Hope's name is Jesus. Jesus. Amen. I love my wife. (laughs) (laughs) That too. Amen. So I want to thank Paul Cole for joining me on this episode of the 318 Project and just to hear him talk about what Christian Men's Network is doing to reach those men around the world through discipling, through reaching, empowering, encouraging leaders, pastors, and just men in general to step up and be the husbands and fathers that God has created him to be. 
And it has always been a pleasure to be able to partner with them these last few years. And again, what they've been pouring into my life and in my family through the ministry of his dad, Dr. Ed Cole, and then what they are continuing to do with CMN as they are branching out, growing, trying to reach more men through not just the books, but through podcasts, through YouTube and just other ways that they are just branching out and reaching men and seeing the effects that it is having because of the society we're facing today and just allowing God to use them and use this ministry to reach men around the world. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of the 318 Project. I hope you got a blessing from it just hearing of what Paul Cole had on his heart of reaching men around the world, as he talked about, and again, the epidemic that we are facing, the crisis of manliness and manhood is being attacked at an all-time rate today. Again, I thank you for joining me. I hope you have been blessed by this. I encourage you guys that if you would, just take the time to like, subscribe, and share this podcast. And as always, I hope you have a a blessed and wonderful day. Thank you for joining on this adventure of integrity and honor in godly masculinity. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this podcast with other men. And remember to keep building faithful men.